Good morning, everyone. A warm welcome to uh, the second Israeli uh, <coughs> conference on uh, the study of religion and to the panel Scriptures as a Mirror. Uh, I'm Ethan Theodore, and first of all, I'd like to uh, extend my very warm uh, thanks to the organizers of this uh, conference, and that includes uh, <coughs> the Department for uh, uh, Jewish Philosophy and uh, <coughs> the Israeli Association for the Study of Religions. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, our panel, as I mentioned, is on the topic of scriptures as a mirror. I think I mentioned. And <coughs> our first um, speaker is Mr. Dmitry Shevchenko, and he's a PhD candidate at the University of New Mexico. He's a graduate of uh, Tel Aviv University, and his interests include Indian philosophy, and especially Sankhya, political philosophy, and philosophy uh, of religion. And his topic is Just Do It, the Injectivist Approach to Scriptures in Ishayao Leibovich and the uh, Mimamsa. Please. Thank you. So the subject of this presentation is a distinctive approach in the philosophy of religion in which scripture is regarded primarily as a source of injunctions for ritual action and normative behavior rather than metaphysical knowledge. I will attempt to reconstruct the basic argument behind what I would like to call scriptural injunctivism based on a comparative study of the contemporary Israeli Jewish philosopher Ishayao Leibovitch and the Indian Mimamsa philosophical tradition. Although coming from distant cultural and historical backgrounds, Leibowitz and the Mimamsa philosophers seem to express similar positions on the questions of the status of uh, scriptural statements, the authority of tradition, the validity and the purpose of scriptural injunctions. Certainly, Mimamsa philosophy is not homogenous, and I will refer to particular philosophers when there are significant divergences of, of opinions between them on particular topics. In cases of general agreement between the philosophers, I will allow myself to generalize about the tradition as a whole. Since my method entails generalizations over different philosophical systems, a nuanced and detailed discussion of various positions within these systems will not always be necessary and desirable for my purposes and for the scope of this paper. The two scriptural texts in question are the Torah and the Veda. The Torah is the authoritative textual corpus of the Jewish religion and often refers in particular to those parts of the scripture which include the commandments and instructions known as mitzvot or ritual and normative behavior given by God to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai. The Torah includes not only the written Torah, Torah Shiba but also the oral Torah, Torah Shiba the explanations without which the mitzvot often re remain obscure. The written and the oral Torah have become the basis for the halacha, the tradition of issuing religious laws derived from the scriptural commandments. As it will become clear from my further discussion, although the subject matter of this study is the injunctive nature of scriptures, Leibowitz justifies his injunctivist position on the basis of the halachic tradition. The Veda is the authoritative text of the ancient Vedic religion and Hinduism, which includes hints to God, sacrificial instructions, mythical stories, as well as philosophical and mystical texts. For the Mimamsa philosophers, however, the Veda is primarily the source of dharma, ritual and social duties. It is a historical fact, argues Leibowitz, that while diverge, divergent movements may have disagreed about, about virtually every doctrine or belief, they remained within the Jewish community as long as they accepted the authority of the halachic tradition. At the same time, those movements which denied the halacha, even if they shared major conceptual assumptions of Judaism or accepted the validity of the Bible, could not remain in the same orthodox framework of the Jewish community. In other words, it was the practical implementation of halachic laws and not particular beliefs that made the historical continuity and identity of Judaism possible. Since Leibowitz bases his argument on the empirical historical manifestation of Judaism and its practices and institutions, it follows that Judaism manifested through them is nothing but the halachic system of mitzvot, the authorizing and regulating principles of the Jewish community. Leibowitz does not deny that Jewish practitioners might hold certain beliefs and values which have their place in Judaism. 
These matters of faith, however, must be seen as the superstructure based upon the foundation of mitzvot, and not vice versa. Leibowitz performs here what his sympathetic commentators often refer to as a Copernican revolution. The widely held conception regarding religious systems in general, and Judaism in particular, has been that religious practices are based on the metaphysical claims of the system. Leibowitz turns the table by arguing that Judaism is a normative system of mitzvot, the fundament of the historical Judaism, upon which may rise all sorts of metaphysical claims. What makes scriptural and halachic conjunctions authoritative and obliging? Leibowitz develops two different versions of the intrinsic validity of the mitzvot. First, the injunctions are valid be, uh, based on the historical and empirical existence of a community of practitioners who accept the burden of the Torah and the mitzvot. The validity of mitzvot comes from their acceptance and implementation by the community of believers. There are no valid external reasons for obeying the mitzvot, such as personal advantage, psychological or spiritual needs, etc. The only valid reason is the believer's choice to obey the commandments rather than reject them. Leibovitz admits that the choice to accept the halachic obligations and the authority of the Torah is a contingent choice, independent of any reasons other than the person's will. Leibovitz, however, is not happy with the religious price of grounding the halacha merely in human activity, and thus he develops his second version of the intrinsic validity of mitzvot. The system of mitzvot is more than a merely human institution. Its source is divine, and its contents are sacred. It is important for Leibovitz to make a point that the religious injunctions are essentially different from any human social norms. While the first kind of intrinsic validity may be recognized in different human social groups in which imperatives are created and followed, only religious commandments are believed to come from God. Leibovitz, however, subordinates the, the Torah's metaphysical claims to normative, and thus the justification of the divine source of the mitzvot may become a problem. How do we know that the mitzvot are commanded or authorized by God without appealing to metaphysical truth statements about God's revelation at Mount Sinai, his communication with Moses, and so forth? Leibovitz's solution aims at grounding faith statements from the written Torah, upon which the divine source of the injunction is based, on yet other injunctions, namely the halachic authorization of the biblical text as sacred. Who has given the human halachic legislator such an authority? The divine source, the written Torah. The validity of the halachic tradition comes from the belief that it has been authorized by God, as we know from the scripture. The paradox is that the validity of the halacha comes from the written Torah, while the validity of the written Torah is based on and determined by the halacha. According to Asa Kasher, however, no paradox of any kind can be found in this mutual validation of the halacha and the scripture, because each of the two validities implies a different status. The halacha provides the Bible, including the written Torah, a status of a sacred scripture, while the Bible grants the halacha the status of God's worship and fight against idolatry. It should be noticed that as the halachic tradition becomes the final instance of legitimation, the written Torah, in fact, loses its intrinsic validity and meaning. At the same time, the mitzvot gain their divine status without compromising their independence from metaphysics. The injunctions are, are divine because we believe that they come from God. But we believe that the injunctions come from God because we are enjoined to do so. Philosophy of Mimamsa presents a similar view regarding the status of the Vedic te texts. According to the Mimamsa Kaz, the Veda does not reveal the factual no nature of the world. It is instead the ultimate source of knowledge about dharma, that is ritual, social norms, and duties. The knowledge of dharma is taught by means of Vedic injunctions, Any mythical, devotional, or philosophical parts of the Vedic scriptures are merely supportive statements, Arthavada, to encourage performance of sacrificial activities. While Leibowitz sees the halacha as human activity claiming to the status of divine based on the written Torah, the Mimamsakas avoid ascribing any human or divine authorship to the Veda, and their arguments focus on the real observable transmission of the Vedic knowledge through the chain of teachers and students. Just like Leibowitz, whose starting point is the historical empirical continuous existence of the halachic tradition, the Mimamsakas also start with the historical empirical fact of the Vedic tradition. The Vedic injunctions, however, are not considered to be the result of human activity. 
In fact, the famous argument of Mimamsa is that the Veda is authorless and eternal. Since no one has observed an author of the Veda, there is no reason to postulate that there ever was such an author. I would like to argue that the Mimamsa philosophers postulate the absence of an author of the Veda with the sole purpose of preventing the possibility of the external falsification of the Veda. Mimamsa's concept of svata pramanya, or the intrinsic validity of cognition, is an original contribution to Indian epistemology. Briefly put, intrinsic validity is a property of all cognitions that are presented to us, unless they are vitiated by other cognitions. This is essentially an anti-skeptical and common sense position, which denies that we should be suspicious about our ordinary perceptions and cognitive experiences. Under normal circumstances, the sources of our cognitions are reliable, and there is no reason to doubt or seek to justify them, unless we have some conflicting cognitions explicitly raising questions about the validity of the previous ones. In other words, each cognition is intrinsically valid, but extrinsically may be disqualified as invalid. What is peculiar about the notion of intrinsic validity of the Vedic scriptures is that there can be no falsifying cognitions in principle. Since the Veda does not have a human author, no defects related to human reliability can be attached to the Vedic testimony. There is no author who could lie or be wrong about the Vedic content. Moreover, because the content of Vedic injunctions is dharma, which is beyond human knowledge, the Veda can neither be the result of reliable human testimony nor refuted by any kind of human perceptual or inferential cognitions. Although both Leibovitz and Mimamsa appeal to similar notions of intrinsic validity, Mimamsa attributes a stronger meaning to the term. For Leibovitz, the validity of the halakhic system is tradition itself, although it does not necessarily make it superior to other traditions. For Mimamsa, validity of the Veda is unique and unrivaled because the Veda is the only means of cognition which does not have an author and has no beginning. I would like to argue that despite these different ways to defend the intrinsic validity of injunctions, some kind of intrinsic validity is necessary for any kind of scriptural injunctivism. If scripture is primarily a source of injunctions and not of any descriptive information about the world, the authority of scriptural injunctions or of the injunctions inferred from scriptural injunctions may not lie on extrinsic validation grounded on some kind of information, evidence, judgment, or speculation. If this were the case, the, injunct the injunctivist nature of scripture would cease to be primary and would depend on non-injunctivist justification. If, on the other hand, the validity of the injunctions were based on some descriptive knowledge, that is, efficacy of ritual, for example, efficacy of ritual actions, injunctions would become secondary and determined by some metaphysical or physical assumptions about how the world is. For scriptural injunctivism, it must remain axiomatic that the deontic nature of the scripture is prior to any metaphysical assumptions. Any epistemological move must take this deontic priority into account. Leibowitz argues that the proper goal of a Jewish practitioner is avodalishma, worship for its own sake. A person worships God, but because God is transcendent, what one cannot say that the purpose of this worship is God's satisfaction or will. Rituals have no meaning except as manifestations of the believer's intention to worship God for its own sake. A person here is instrumental to a purpose which transcends the world of human needs. Certainly, people often observe the mitzvot for the sake of other purposes, expecting rewards, pursuing mystical experiences, finding psychological relief in prayer, or enjoying the sense of community. Leibowitz, however, is very clear that any motivation for performing mitzvot other than for their own sake is avodash elolishma, worship not for its own sake, and constitutes idolatry. It should be noted that later, Leibowitz revises her, his earlier identification between worship not for its own sake and idolatry, and admits that God's worship, no matter the intention behind it, does not constitute idolatry. In general, idolatry for Leibowitz equals attributing absolute values to, to things other than God, such as nation, humanity, statehood, etc. In Mimamsa, one finds a variety of responses to the question of the purpose of Vedic rituals. I will focus, however, on the view of Prabhakara from the 8th century, whose position on the purpose of injunctions is the closest to that of Leibowitz. Vedic injunctions, such as, quote, one desiring heaven should perform the Jyotishtama sacrifice, end of quote, 
include both human goals, that is, one desire in heaven, and the imperative to sacrifice, that is, one should sacrifice. <clears throat> Thus, there is no question of which purpose should be accepted and which is to be rejected. The matter of dispute is rather the primacy and subordination between the two purposes. Prabhakara, the founder of one of the two main branches of Mimamsa, argues that even if an action leads to a good result, the fact that the duty to perform rituals is formulated as an injunction means that action must be performed simply because, quote, this should be done, idam karyam. The imperative, by the very grammatical form, has the power to inspire the hearer towards acting without any need to provide incentives and explanations. Mohanty points out that, the Prab that Prabhakara's view revives an older view ascribed to Badari, who held that the Vedic injunctions impose duties on men irrespective of whether they bring about desirable results or not. Prabhakara's and Badari's daunting interpretation of Vedic injunctions is rather similar to Lebowitz's conce conception of Lishmar. It should be noted, however, that human goals for the first two philosophers are not prob problematized in the same way as for Lebowitz. It is generally agreed that sacrifices do satisfy human desires and that human happiness depends on them. It is not wrong for people to act out of their personal motives. The only problem seems to be an attribution of human purpose to injunctions whose grammatical form is intended for commanding. One can argue that a descriptive form of sentences explaining the benefits of particular actions should be enough to convince people to act for their own good. The form of imperative is much stronger and urges people to perform an action simply because it is their duty. The ontic interpretation of, of scriptural injunction as a commandment of duty is consistent with the assumptions of the injunctivist position. An acceptance of scripture's authority as the source of injunctions necessarily implies one's obedience to these injunctions. Human goals do not contradict scriptural injunctivism, but they are not implied by it. Thus, thus by the inner logic of injunctivism, the purposes of scriptural injunctments are primarily deontological. Right, so this is basically a conclusion. From the general analysis of, Flebowitz, of Flebowitz's and the Mimamsa systems, I have attempted to draw some common features of scriptural injunctivism. This is the place to sum them up. First, an assumption that a particular scripture is primarily a source of injunctions is axiomatic in the sense that it is not based on any metaphysical, mythical, or mystical content found either in the same scripture or external to it. In other words, Scripture is primarily prescriptive rather than descriptive. Second, it follows from the above axiom that the validity of scriptural injunctions or of the injunctions inferred from scriptural injunctions is justified primarily on the grounds of some form of intrinsic validity. Third, in view of the above two premises, the purpose of scriptural injunctions or of the injunctions inferred from scriptural injunctions is primarily one's obedience to these injunctions. The word primarily is included in each of the above statements to indicate the possibility of further additions to this simple structure. Thus, regarding the first statement, it is possible for scriptures to contain non-injunctive content, which does not affect in any way the primary injunctive force of a scripture. Scriptural injunctions can, and, uh, scriptural injunctions can also be defended as being authoritative by means of extrinsic arguments. For, in, for instance, Leibovitz argues that only Lishma motivation is capable of bringing human he, uh, beings from the realm of necessity to the realm of freedom. Mimamsak has appealed to the efficacy of the Vedic sacrifices. These arguments must remain, however, secondary to the intrinsic validity of, of scriptures, so that even if the above arguments were proven to be false, validity of the injunctions could not be vitiated. The purpose of injunctions can either remain strictly deontological, as Leibowitz argues, or other purposes could be added, such as human ends, according to Mimamsa. Prabhakara and Badari are consistent injunctivists, and their admittance of human purposes does not deviate from the injunctivist position as human purposes are subordinated to the unconditional obligation to follow Vedic commandments. Scriptural injunctivism is formally valid, although without ad hoc additions, it does not allow for a clear criterion for giving preference to one injunctivist tradition over the other. Can the Torah and the Veda be both intrinsically valid at the same time? While injunctivism is probably predominantly attractive to orthodoxy, it can be identified in various traditions, in different religious and normative systems. I hope that understanding some general decontextualized features of this position might be useful for studying particular traditions in their context.
So we can open the floor for some questions. So in general, the Mimamsa system, so it's a, um, a distinct philosophical school in India, starting, well, yeah. its origins are very ancient. Uh, but, and in general, they are interested in hermeneutics, uh, in, um, in lots of different questions. At some point, other questions are also incorporated um, into the interests of this, uh, of this tradition. But in general, they're interested in, um, in the ways to interpret the scriptures right. And their position was basically again, stri very strictly injunctivist. Right? They were not really interested so much in metaphysical parts of, or mystical parts or mythical parts of the Vedas. They would say, well, there are all these parts. You can find them. But the only reason for, uh, for this uh, non-injunctivist contents there is to bring you to perform the Vedic, uh, the Vedic uh, sacrifice. No, the problem with the meaning is that when you use hermeneutics, mm -hmm. you give a validity to the words of the, of the text. Mm -hmm. And the uh, validity to you give the, the scriptural text uh, that you uh, certify the text is one aspect of medical or religious or divinity or something else. But as I understand him, from this point of view, you don't ask about this thing. Mm -hmm. The words is from the, con the context of the words. Um, it's like the f like a uh, very modern philosophy of uh, language. Of mm -hmm. Here I think that there's a, um, a gap between this, the sanctity that you get to the text and the way that you think about the meaning of words. Mm -hmm. This is the only question. For me, language is very similar because language, uh, okay, say, you're right, there is a gap, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Well, the meaning of words is uh, is a large, yeah, a large topic in the Mimamsa, and um, well, I kind of I referred mostly to the syntactic kind yeah, of no. dimension, right? Of uh, how do we understand the injunctions in, in in the Vedas, right? Is it something that we are advised to do, right, to pursue our human happiness, or is it just a commandment? You should do it, right? So Prabhakar argues you just must do it. The meaning. Uh, the, meaning of the, the meaning of the words comes from the meaning of the sentence, basically. Right? You should understand the sentence in its entirety, okay. what the sentence makes you to do, which is also a very uh, con modern, basic view of uh, Yeah. It's a This rests in the Vedas on this idea that the task, the human task, is to transform the individual into the person. So the, the doing of the point of the emphasis on the logical injunction is that you, you just do it you know, mm -hmm. without meaning and without substance, which leads us to an extraordinarily troubling theology when it's applied to Hebrew scriptures, right? Because what sort of God 
do it now. That makes you do ridiculous things just for the purpose of just it seems completely arbitrary. This is something Saul Berman has pointed out. Um, that you can't that theologically this is that it fails at this moment. Because of course you wouldn't have a God that makes you jump on three feet or separate from dishes or something. Because it, you know what I'm saying? There has to be some content that we don't yet know. This is is happening. And that, you know, I'm not sure what you do with that, but I think there's a few times or something. Can, can well, you explain the, the last sentence that you said? Well, if, mm -hmm. if, if, if in the data, you don't have an author, mm -hmm. right? So you just have the text. Mm -hmm. So then you can have a human being say, then you can have collections of human beings saying, okay, this is what we're going to do, we're just going to do this, because it seems as though this text wants us to be disciplined in a certain way, because the, the kind of body that does these things, these activities, is the right sort of body for human beings. Mm -hmm. That's the claim of this. Of, of, of mm -hmm. um, but when we, when we switch that over to Torah, mm -hmm. that can't possibly be the right answer. That can't possibly be. There's trouble here theologically because the text, embedded in the text, is this argument that God cares about mm -hmm. human persons and, and makes meaning for human persons. And there's, some, there's a point to this, to, to human activity and to embodied actions. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, argues against random um, sacrifice or empty sacrifice is just for the purpose of doing it. So it leads to a puzzle. And it, it, I did this too, like looking at Eastern traditions and seeing your similar up, right up to the a certain point and then the difference of the So basically in both traditions you can find, well, even this sentence that I referred to before, um, one design haven't you performed the Jyotishtama sacrifice. Right. So you, you have this uh, human, uh, human ends, right? Mm -hmm. uh, basically, heaven is kind of a code, a code word for, for human happiness. If you want happiness, right, in this life or, or, or an afterlife, you should perform the Jyotishtama sacred sacrifice or other sacrifice for this sake. Right? But again, but this sentence, it includes both. So it, it has this kind of human ends. Right? You should you can you, you perform you are motivated to, to perform certain ritual. But there's also the imperative, you should do it no matter what. And that's why different uh, schools basically interpreted uh, this sentence in different ways. So some some would say that actually the this part is subordinated to the first part. Right? You perform sacrifices for the sake of heaven. Okay, well, let me let me push this just a little bit. A sentence like um, I'm sorry. Um, did you address the point? Is it, uh, yeah, so was, uh, basically, and then in, in, in Lego, it's, it's, it's the same. It's the th same thing, right? So, uh, of course, in Judaism, there are all kinds of statements and uh, many beliefs that are supposed to benefit human beings or um, the Jewish practitioner. But Lego, it says, no. I mean, all these parts are secondary. What is important, you do things for lishma. You can start. Uh, I don't know, let's say you're converted in bef because you like this community and you enjoy uh, the prayer and uh, you find some spiritual satisfaction in it. This is fine as long as you come later to the point that you perform rituals just for the sake of, of the worship. Let's take one more question and move on. Okay. Sure. <coughs> Maybe I take the liberty to ask the last question because mm -hmm. time is short. Uh, first of all, thank you for a very stimulating lecture. Uh, a paper <coughs> uh, with a tinge of self-promotion, self I can say that I'm also co-editing a book on Dharma and Halakha mm -hmm. about this topic, so I'm very much interested in that. It seems that <coughs> the problem, <coughs> or the question, uh, one of the main questions you're addressing is the motivation mm -hmm. for uh, following the uh, mitzvahs and the, the vidis. And uh, as there are a few Sanskritists here, I guess I'm allowed to quote a Sanskrit verse, Karmani Eva Nikalasteima Paleshu Bhagavad Gita Kadachana Makarma Pala Hetur Burma Tesangastra Karmani, which is the famous philosophy of uh, work without regards to the fruits. Mm -hmm. So you see what this is, mm -hmm. uh, that's the main point here. Now, uh, the Vedic ethos is sacrificial. Mm -hmm. The whole Vedic ethos is sacrificial. And my question is, does Leibovitch also have this uh, idea of sacrificial ethos to his idea of following the injunctions? A sacrificial ethos of what? Uh, in his uh, understanding uh -huh. of the injunctions, the, the mitzvahs. I'm trying to aim that the, the Jewish mitzvahs are coming from the, the temple and the, mm -hmm. the sacrificial ethos of the temple. And I'm trying to see if Leibovitch has some ideas such as that, if there's any idea of, of the mitzvahs as a sacrifice, that's, that's my question. 
Well, what's interesting is that uh, both in the Halakha and in the Mimamsa, there are lots of discussions about um, sacrifices, right? At the time when sacrifices are not being um, uh, conducted. So the Mimamsa, they, they speak a lot about, well, when they say you, ha you should perform the Jyotishtama sacrifice, but nobody really conducts any these, these sacrifices <laughs> during that time, right? And today, of course. So, um, Lebowitz, I don't remember if he was talking particularly about sacrifice. He was talking about the halacha in general and the um, mitzvot in general. But, um, but again, it's interesting that both traditions, there are lots of debates on this topic which, are, which become purely theoretical. They're not practical. Right? Like the, you should conduct the sacrifice, but you can't really. You don't. Right, thank you. Thank you.